Okay, I want you to see a nice view. This is, uh, had a hard time. I clicked this phone three times and it's taking pictures instead of video mode. Um, there's a homeless, just for, I went to the Catholic Cathedral and it's windy and I was debating on as soon as I left uh, of starting the video. But right now this is like a less windy spot and I want you to see beautiful, this is Cole Park, but I'm going to walk right up to this amphitheater and just kind of speak inside the little amphitheater. Nobody's using it right now. It's an outdoor venue. Uh, a few notes. I posted, whenever you see the real time, you're going to see that also on future videos. So you always look at the date. I'm not trying to trick people. I do understand sometimes video uploads, people make it look like it's live. It's not. I don't like to do that myself. But it's too difficult for me to, if you start posting many and uploading and you change the title to one, it messes things up. So when I say real time, when you see them in the future, it just simply meant I posted it before I reviewed it and it's somewhat of a live video. It's very beautiful. Oh, I think there's some kids up here. I was gonna, I was gonna speak in there, but I got this on. I don't like to stop now. All right, let me do a little, uh, hi guys, I'm going to just stand, I'm doing like a little Bible study, but I got to get out of the wind. <laughs> no, it's okay, you can say hi if you want. Sometimes when I make these videos, and I teach the Bible on Sunday, but if it's windy, people can't hear my video, and I thought today, oh, I'll come like into this thing. I was going to walk down the skate thing, over there, the skate park thing, that, but there's some kids there. All right, so we got a couple of nice young boys. All right, the verses from the Mass. I was going to review them. I did uh, Friday. I looked at them on Saturday, but I didn't get a chance just now. <laughs> I'm grateful that they had on the church bulletin for the cathedral. I looked at it, and they had all the verses uh, written down, the references. Oftentimes, they don't do that, so I could have read it right from the church bulletin uh, remembering those passages. I want to start Isaiah 49, 1 through 6. <laughs> Isaiah 49 is a great chapter, by the way, but we're going to kind of focus on the first six verses. Listen, O isles, or islands, unto me, and hearken ye people from afar. For the Lord has called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. He has made me like a polished shaft, like an arrow sent forth. If you go down the whole chapter, this is, you can, this just so happens to be, I forget if I even mentioned it yet. This is the celebration for the Catholic Church, uh, which was the nativity, the birth of John the Baptist. Also, it's possible that the Orthodox churches and other Christian churches are following along that same like liturgical year. And it was interesting because I did post, I believe that was the verse at the top of today's posted Sunday sermon, which was not planned or organized. Uh, I usually will just go through all the verses that I quoted on the video and pick one for the top or whatever. And I remember I didn't really uh, look for the best one as I was copying and pasting verses. I just said, oh, I'm going to stick one on top, and it happened to be John, John the Baptist. Now, this uh, chapter, Isaiah 49, it's also famous verses. Paul will use one. Uh, today is the acceptable day. This is the acceptable day of salvation. An acceptable time have I heard thee, and a day of salvation have I helped thee. The Apostle Paul uses that in Romans chapter 10, a very key verse. A lot of evangelical churches focus a lot on those scriptures. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Also in Isaiah 49, it's a prophecy that says, I have engraven you upon the palms of my hands. Now, what a picture of the crucifixion that is. That, uh, hello, brother. You get to, I got a little, uh, or, uh, I forget the term, but no, he could listen. I hope he hears the verses. Okay, so we're engraving on the palms of the hands. Of course, that would be a type of uh, a speaking of the crucifixion, all right? So we are marked on his hands. 
uh, the calling of John the Baptist, which is focused on, how does that scripture fit in with it? The one from Isaiah 49. It says, before you were born, I named you and I called you. Now, we find that with Jeremiah the prophet. We find that, of course, with Jesus himself. So you have particular prophetic uh, figures in scripture where they were named and called before they were born, putting on the, the destiny of God on those people. And today's focus happens to be John. Now, the next scripture would be Acts 13, if I'm on, 22 through 26. Now, if you start a few verses before, uh, maybe verse 17 of Acts 13, this is one of the sermons of Paul. And Paul does a brief history of Israel. And if you want the most in-depth history of the Bible in one Bible chapter, it would be Acts chapter 7, if I got it right, which would be the long sermon of Stephen, who is martyred at the end of that chapter. And in Acts 7, Stephen goes down the whole history of Israel. It's a very long chapter, and it covers if there was any one single chapter that you would want to get a good history of the Bible covered in it, that would be the chapter. Now, Paul does it in a shorter version here, but he quickly, he's, he's preaching to the Jewish people as well as to the God-fearers and anybody that's hearing, and then he says, God brought our fathers out, and then we, we came into this, he dispossessed the people in the land of Canaan, brought us in. Then he raised up judges for 400 and something years. And then after that, uh, there was a king that the people wanted. This is all the history. I covered this last year in the book of Samuel and Kings. And then Paul says something interesting from my Bible scholars. He says, and their first one that he raised up was Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. And you know, that's Paul's name was Saul before his conversion. And if I remember right, Paul is from the tribe of Benjamin. And I always wondered if he was kind of also saying, you see, God has also put a particular name on him, Paul, in a sense. And he sent someone from the tribe of Benjamin to them, almost identifying his own apostolic calling. But he doesn't say that. He's just covering the history. Then he says, and then he raised up David, the second king of Israel, a man after God's own heart. And then he made these promises to the fathers that someday from the seed of David there would come a deliverer, there would come a savior. And Paul is basically proclaiming the promises that God made to the Jewish nation as well as to all nations. But even the students of the Bible, Paul himself was a Pharisee, they knew all of this history and all of these scriptures, yet they fought so hard against the message of the gospel. Because Paul would later tell us in all of the writings in the New Testament that it was sinfulness, trying to be justified through the law. And they rejected the gospel. So Paul is making clear in Acts 13, in the verses for this Sunday's Mass, which happens to be, I should give that, 6-24-2018. So then he says, this is the answer. It was Christ. He was promised to us, and he's come to us from the seed of David. And to you is the word of this salvation son. And whoever will believe this gospel, whoever will receive that the promises that God made to our fathers, to the Jewish Old Testament figures, patriarchs, and all, he's fulfilled those promises to Christ. All right, that's Acts 13, the other reading. Now, the last reading, if you will, from the Mass would be Luke 1 verses 57 through 80. I should pull out the, I like the way the, uh, the little pamphlet from the mass, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save like a part of it just for the pretty art. But Luke 1, even the passage I just mentioned, what, 57 through 80, it's, the, it's kind of a long reading for a gospel reading. To do it justice, we would probably start earlier in that chapter which is a very long chapter, 80 verses. So let me show you this and then we'll start that. 
the promise that John the Baptist was going to come was in multiple prophecies of the Old Testament. Now you had other people that would be, Paul himself will teach us, God had placed in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And you had many gifted people and continued throughout the church. But all prophets weren't prophesied to come, if you will, even by name. So there's a significance of John. Let me see if you can see that. I liked the way they had even the little artwork. His name is John, which is the scripture we'll get to. And I liked the way they had the verses. They actually did have the uh, verses written out or referenced. In Luke 1, Zacharias, the father of John, who is yet to be born, and his wife Elizabeth, we read that Zacharias is a priest, according to the law, was, it says, fulfilling his course, which was his duty. And it was in the fulfilling of what, it was in being faithful to simply serving God in his way at that season that God began to do a great thing. You know, a lot of times, so it's in his course that something's going to happen. And it says, as his custom was, he went into the temple, and when he went into the temple to burn incense, it says, all the people were outside praying. And in the midst of him being faithful to what God called him to do, then something happens out of the ordinary. Understand, Zacharias was not looking, if you will, for the miracle breakthrough in the sense that nothing, I, I'm gonna, everything's going to fall apart unless I get this miracle. But granted, God does indeed do miracles, and he does indeed intervene in the affairs of men. But if we look at this example, it's while you're being faithful, doing regularly, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. I talk about, uh, oftentimes when I make videos, I say, you know, I just got done praying for a very long period of time. And it's not to boast of the prayer time, but it's to say, that's a big thing. I, I don't think of, if I spend, which I do, more time praying than working on the post or actually working on all the other stuff, I don't see that as a waste of time. So Zacharias was doing what God called him to do. Now, when he went into the temple that day, we're in Luke 1, extended commentary on a portion of the Mass verse out of Luke. <coughs> Something happened. The angel Gabriel appears to Zacharias, and he says, your prayers are heard. Your wife Elizabeth is going to have a son. Now, this is the angel Gabriel speaking about the prophet John who was prophesied about multiple times in the Old Testament. I'll send my messenger before thy face who will turn the hearts of children and fathers fathers to the children. The voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare you the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. All of these Old Testament prophets were speaking of John someday coming, John the Baptist. And so now the angel is there Gabriel the trumpeter, if you will, he's there to announce that this is the time, this is the season. And it just so happens, Zacharias, that God chose you and your wife who have had no children. And obviously you were praying for a child because the angel actually said, your prayers are now heard. So it wasn't just, we're going to give you a child, Zacharias. It was because the reason you waited so long, the reason your wife was barren, and in the first century it was a lot different than it is today. If you didn't have children, you were almost looked at as someone that was kind of like under a curse, if you will. I know we live in a society today where people say we have to find ways to eliminate children. But in that time, that economy, if you will, being barren was, you were looked upon badly. So they were just praying for a child, not necessarily the fulfillment of one of the greatest prophets that Jesus would said that would walk the earth. There's none greater than John, Jesus said, out of the prophets. 
All right, so the angel reveals this great thing to Zacharias as he's serving God in his priestly capacity. And what does Zechariah say? He says, how could this be? You know, sometimes you pray for things, you have faith for things, but maybe you don't have faith because it's finally going to be the answer to the prayer that maybe they were praying it for so long they just got used to not having an answer to prayer because that was what the angel said. The things you prayed for, it's now God's heard the prayer and he tells the angel, I mean, he was scared. In scripture, when angels appear to people, people are terrified. So he was scared, but then when this message is communicated by an angel of God in the temple, he then begins to question the angel. And Gabriel says, I'm Gabriel, I stand before God. I've come to speak these words to you. It's almost like the angel is saying, don't you see me, I'm an angel? Uh, are you not getting this yet, son? But because he doubted, the angel says, you're not going to be able to speak until these words are performed. You know, oftentimes people look for a venue to speak, a venue to communicate. And God says, I want to perform some things. And until I can perform those things, it's by his grace that you don't have a venue. Okay, now he's silent. Now he's not able to speak. Something's wrong. And he comes out of the temple. He was in there a long time. And the people realize something happened. And then when he comes out, I want you to kind of get the whole picture of the story here. He's asking for people, like for a writing tablet, if, if you will. They use tablets sort of like a wax thing, and you would write in them. You had other writings at the time, too. And they're saying, like, what happened? And they knew something happened. All right, he's now dumb, Zacharias, until the time of the promise, which was some months later. Not able to speak, but still serving the Lord. Then the verses that the Mass for today, which is, starts in verse 57. The time of the birth of John draws near. And Elizabeth gives birth to John, the great forerunner, John the Baptist. And as she gives birth, they come to circumcise John the Baptist on the eighth day, and they got to name him. Now, Elizabeth is the one that says, we're going to call him John. And now all the people are, it wasn't in the tradition of that day to pick a name, if you will, out of the air. That was not popular. They said, no, what do you mean you're going to name him John? Now, they know that the husband, Zacharias, has not been able to speak all this time. And there's like strange events taking place besides the fact that Gabriel came and gave this message to the father of John the Baptist. And they were a local community, so word got around and they were kind of wondering about, man, this is going to be a special child. So they say to Elizabeth, what are we going to name him? Uh, is it going to be John? Uh, no one in your family. You know, it should be like Zacharias Jr. will name him after the phone. Then they give a writing tablet to Zacharias. And he says, no, his name is John. Now remember something. The angel didn't tell that to Elizabeth. So after Zacharias had this experience that I just described, he obviously wrote to his wife what happened. And wrote, and the angel said, we're going to call him John. So she was going to follow those instructions. And as soon as Zacharias, in obedience, wrote down his name is John, it says his tongue was loosed, he was able to speak. And then he, he enters into this great prophetic praise. And all the people, it says, that word went out to all the region round about. Like something's going on here. And then Zacharias, and in this whole chapter you read also, uh, the Mary's Magnificat is going to come later. But the same type of thing, when Mary gives birth to Christ, you're going to read these prophetic praises. And the one that Mary gives, filled with the Spirit, is called Mary's Magnifica. And, John, and Zacharias is filled with the Spirit. And what does he say? This is how it fits with the Mass verse. He said, and God has visited us. He's raised up a horn of salvation, just like he said. See, just like Paul was preaching in Acts 13. This, this is a promise, and John's the forerunner, and here's the horn of salvation. 
and he gives us great praise. And it says, the child was in the wilderness in time until the days of his appearing. And that was the ministry of John, out in the wilderness. And then he came as a radical. And he was not associated, if you will, with the religious class of that day, which were indeed the professional Pharisees and Sadducees, who were the ones that actually will give Jesus a very hard time. But John was not associated with them. He was cold and waiting in a period of wilderness waiting, if you will. And then he comes out of the desert and we read his short ministry because he gets in his head taken off by Herod, the calling of John. All right, now I covered the three. I want you to see a little bit more into those verses. I had a few things I could share. Uh, let's see, I think I covered most of it. And we did how long? 20 minutes? I think I'll end it on that. Oh, okay, let me do the last one. This is not news, so I can, it, it'll have value when you see these replay. You know, messing with all of my uh, websites the last few days, and a lot of things I mess with, I, I had to learn some new functions, because when you, you have more than one YouTube channel. Now I have three. And then you have Gmail, or hooked up through Google Chrome, very difficult because you it disconnects each one so I had to learn through the creative studio how to switch between these three various YouTube channels I have now without disconnecting from the internet basically your your Gmail and everything else it's not it's hard okay so you got to learn that but because I'm in the process of learning it I, I had to find a function that says uh, how do I scroll the videos from the oldest to the newest, so I could repost starting from the beginning on one of the sites. And then it said, most popular videos. And I thought, well, let me click that just to see, maybe like I would post the most popular ones first. One video said 1.7K views. I said, that can't be right. One video has 1.7 uh, 1,700 views is what that means. And I thought, I don't even think I, but no, I got about 10,000 views total on that particular YouTube channel. Because at first I'm thinking, so that, and I've been questioning that. And then I looked at the video, and I remember it. I made it not too far from him. The video, it was said that that got that many views. I'm glad it got views. But it was called my castration video. Now, I do not title things just to get, okay? I remember I was with Pops that day, and the little thumbnail of the video shows a woman with a face like in shock. I did not pick that thumbnail for that video, meaning I did not want people to see the title that said, my castration video, purposefully alongside with the thumbnail of, a, of the photo of a girl looking like she's in shock. But I remember it was Pops had a girl that stayed with him. He helped people. Pops, who passed away, didn't live. He right, lived right down in that area. And so one day when I visited Pops, I, I, those of you that followed the videos know Pops used to talk a lot, and I tried to teach a little bit. And, but I remember one day he kind of sometimes goes off track, he was talking about circumcision and a lot of things. And so as a sort of like to try to, you know, mellow it out a little, I remember saying like, oh, I'm going to have to title this the castration video just to kind of like. And so I titled it that. And then I realized that video got 1,700 1, views because of the title and the look. I think the girl's name was Christine. She was like staying there for a while just as a roommate with Pops. She was a sweet girl. And when I went and visited Pops, and maybe I did a little Bible study where they had questions. And I said, isn't that sad, though, that that's what drove that? And I'm grateful that it wasn't done on purpose for that. But then I read in the news yesterday, or this morning, there was a YouTube kid whose wife shot him on YouTube and killed him. And it was a stump. This young boy in his 20s was trying to develop 
a YouTube channel. I never heard of him before. Supposedly he was popular. And it was supposed to be like the MTV show where you do these real dangerous stunts. And he had an, a thick uh, phone book or encyclopedia or something. And he's telling his girlfriend, they did not, I did not watch the video, and I don't think they have the whole video shown anymore. But you could have watched a part of it, and I didn't watch a part of it. This was on regular news, online news. And he's telling the girl, I read the transcript, he tells his wife, no, shoot me, shoot me. If, as long as you hit the book, I'll be okay. And she had a 50 caliber, I think it said. And so, she, and you could hear the wife, I think they had a child. And she said, I'm afraid, I don't want to do it. He said, as long as you hit the book, she shot him and killed him. Now, sadly, she, she got like 180 days in jail. Obviously, I think that was okay for this, the way it happened. He was trying to develop a channel by doing dangerous stunts. And we, we question, like YouTube or media online, I question whether we should permit any of that, okay? Uh, we talk about speech and danger. Should we allow people at all to be doing dangerous stunt videos for YouTube, for whatever it is? You say, John, but sometimes you're in dangerous. I'm not planning those. When you see me, maybe I'm confronted by somebody on the street. Or I'm not planning those, all right? So I just, I just felt that was sad. The, the way that happened. Okay, those are the only updates I can do being this is a teaching video. So I, I pray that you would see something in these scriptures that I just showed. I'm going to walk back and you get a nice view. It's very pretty here. But oftentimes when you're waiting on something from God, like Zacharias and Elizabeth, you continue to serve God and it says in Luke 1, in his course. He knew the course. He knew the pattern. The scriptures, I quote a lot of verses in my prayer time besides when I teach. The soul of the praise glorifieth me. And to him that works his conversation aright, I will show the salvation of God. So you have praise being offered along with ordering your conversation right. The miracle, if you will, that Zacharias, the father of experience was not because he was just waiting for the miracle. As a matter of fact, he was serving the Lord so faithfully all those years that when the angel finally told him, here's the miracle, he just got used to doubting, if you will. Like, how could this be? You've been praying about it, brother, all those years. And but some people are living on, on desperate means and they, and they say, if I don't get a certain miracle, I won't make it. Whether Zacharias ever had his miracle with Elizabeth, he was still going to make it. Because he learned how to follow the order and the course that God gave him. He was disciplined in fulfilling the mission. Whether he had the 1.7 hits, whether that was 1,000 So, ministry <laughs> calling is... Granted, in the example of John the Baptist, John's course was foreordained, but he still was obedient. So we don't choose whether God's calling us happens to be like a John the Baptist or happens to be what some consider the lesser gift. It's not based on the popularity. John the Baptist had to be just as faithful. Though he was foretold by the prophets, though the scripture said he was foiled with the spirit by his mother's from his mother's womb, he was obedient. If you call those religious leaders, they showed up at his services. He wasn't nice. Those were the religious leaders that made them do the will of God all that time. And he said, bring forth fruit and fruit. John chapter 3, Paul, by the way, in the verse of Acts 13, Paul actually spoke about John in the Acts 13 passage. He says, I'm not the one. There's one coming after me whose shoes latch it. I'm not worthy to lose. He's the one. And in John chapter 3, which is not part of the last verses, I'm talking as I go back. That's exactly what happens. The disciples of John come to him in the great John chapter 3. 
and they say, John, all of the, the people are going to Jesus. They were like worried they were losing their congregation, they were losing the crowd. And John says, no, that's my joy, there is this fulfilled. That they're going to go to void. He was just listening and hearing the bride go to the bridegroom. And that's what John said, that's how it's, my, his joy was fulfilled, that he was fulfilling the destiny that the people were going to Christ. All right, so we'll end it with that. I'm walking back. Bless you guys. That's it for today.